in full swing, Brian and Tori would go around the school filming some of their classmates. They really fancied themselves auteurs and had big dreams of becoming famous directors in Hollywood. A month into the school year, Brian and Tori show up at their classmate Cassie Joe's locker with a camera. You're on camera, Cassie. Wave to the camera and say hi. And you can see the footage she does. The evening of September 22, 2006, Tori and Brian are driving around Pocatello. And, you know, they're filming each other like many teens do. And this is really pre-social media days, so it's not, you know, selfies and Snapchats and Insta stories. It's like... This is a real actual camera. Real not actual even a, Not even cam- a phone camera. Right, exactly. And on camera, the boys discuss classy killings, famous killers, and even who their first target is. In the footage, one of the boys says there should be no law against killing people. Here is that clip. There should be no law against killing people. I know it's a wrong thing, but hell, hell, you restrict somebody from it, they're going to want it more. And later on the tape, they say, discussing Cassie, who's going to be their victim, they say she's going to be alone in a big dark house out in the middle of nowhere. How perfect can you get? We found our victim and sad as it may be, she's our friend. But you know what? We all have to make sacrifices. Our first victim is going to be Cassie's daughter. She's going to be alone in a big, dark house out in the middle of nowhere. How perfect can you get? The afternoon of September 22nd, Brian and Tori show up to the house that Cassie is house-sitting. Cassie's house sitting, I believe it was for her aunt, and her aunt was a little bit further outside of town. She wasn't right in the town center the way, um, you know, I think the boys and uh, Cassie is normally. And Cassie has her boyfriend, uh, Matt, come over, you know, like a lot of teens do, Come over for the afternoon, hang out, you know. Yeah, and then that way she's not going to feel alone. She'll feel a little bit safe until it gets dark, and she she won't be the only person there in that big, strange house by herself. Exactly. And, you know, Brian and Tori decide that they're going to take a visit, and they stop by the house. You know, Cassie and Matt are pretty welcoming, and, you know, they are wanting to be inclusive of their classmates, and... Cassie Joe, Matt, Brian, and Tori watch a movie together. It should have been a really fun day. It should. So Cassie Joe, uh, wanting to be inclusive and friendly to her classmates, you know, welcome Brian and Tori in. And the four of them, Brian, Tori, Matt, and Cassie Joe, all watch a movie. After a little bit of time before the sun sets, Brian and Tori take off, leaving Cassie, Joe, and Matt alone. The residents of the home that Cassie is house-sitting for, they come home and they find her lifeless in a pool of blood in their living room. A frantic 911 call is placed, and soon, this quiet Pocatello neighborhood is teeming with ambulances, police cars, and police dogs searching the house and area for any unusual activity. As the sleepy town wakes up, they're confronted with the horrifying news of Cassie's murder. And with it being what we like to call a Goldilocks town, which is like not too big, not too small, it's just the perfect size— It comes with a great community support and a network, and it also comes with a very active rumor mill. So first the rumors begin to swirl that it had to have been a drifter, like nobody in our community would be the type of person who could commit this heinous, cold-blooded crime. Yeah, a lot of people really 
wanted to think that it was someone on the outside, someone who just passed through town, it's stranger danger. And I'm sure part of the reason for that was maybe because of the location of where the home was. It wasn't even right. you know close to the high school or anything like that. So right. they're not going to start thinking anything. The police are pretty quick to dismiss the theory that a drifter or somebody from out of town just kind of wandered in and um, killed this poor teenage girl. Mm -hmm. So they set their eyes on Cassie's boyfriend, Matt, because, you know, anytime uh, someone's murdered, they go to the significant other first. And he Um, would have been the last one to have seen her alive. Technically, given, you know, what she told her parents and everything about what they were going to be doing, they were supposed to be together. So he quickly rises to the top of the person of interest list, and he's brought in for questioning. But he quickly tells the police that he wasn't alone with Cassie. Tori and Brian, their friends, were also there with them. So Tori and Brian, days after the murder, are at school living their life as if nothing is wrong. That's until police are made aware that Tori and Brian were with Cassie and Matt and were some of the last people to see her alive. Tori and Brian are both questioned individually and their stories don't match up. Under police pressure, Brian cracks first. Brian admits to the police that they did kill Cassie and leads the police to Black Rock Canyon and uncovers the evidence the boys buried, including the videotape they made of them plotting the murder. The police were stunned when they uncovered the videos. The videos not only showed the premeditation of the crime, but it also shows the before. And here's a clip of some of what they were plotting. It was 9.50, September 22nd, 2006. We know there's lots of doors. There, there's lots of places to hide. I locked the back doors. That's all I locked. Now we just got to wait. And here's a clip of them right after the crime. I just killed Cassie. We just left her house. This is not a fucking joke. I stabbed her in the throat and I saw her lifeless body just disappear. Dude, I just killed Cassie. Oh, oh, fuck. That felt like fucking real. I mean, it went by so fast. Shut the fuck up. We gotta get our act straight. Okay. Tori tries to proclaim his innocence after confessing to his participation in the murder and claims he thought he was acting. Tori's last-ditch attempt at remaining a free man is thinly veiled as he has lists of murder plots, horror films, and alarming materials in his journals. Tori's finger-pointing backfires as he is tried, as is Brian in a court of law. Tori's involvement in this crime raises questions about an unsolved murder of Nori Jones, a woman who was murdered a couple years prior and lived close to Tori. Finally, both boys are sentenced to life without parole. Tori is still trying to find some post-conviction relief. Yeah, he actually recently, his attorney set up a petition to try and get a uh, post conviction relief and what is post conviction relief it's when you get a sentence reduction or instead of life without parole the courts might say you can get 25 to life or 15 to life or you know post conviction relief is really after you've been sentenced any kind of um assistance to help get a lower sentence So I have a question about this case. Go. Other than the videos and other than um, the materials in the journals, was there any other evidence? They had scream masks and the murder weapon was all buried together. Okay. With the videos. With the videos. Oh, so then they had that DNA evidence. They had the DNA evidence. They had the confession. They had the videos of them plotting. The video is, is astonishing. I've never seen anything like it with how detailed and calculated they are with the with planning out the crime. And what they had wanted to do was to pick off different classmates one by one. Oh, so it was kind of like this was the first of several murders that they were planning. Correct. 
And it, it was, it's kind of started with Brian's obsession with Columbine. Mm-hmm. And which I think was, which I feel like was just an after effect of him feeling isolated and alone, mm-hmm. you know? So then he really turned that outward, turned those feelings of sadness outward into like fury and violence against the the perceived perpetrators, you know, yeah. is how I, I feel. Well, it's a strange intersection of, you know, the fascination with Columbine, filmmaking, the screen movies, and feeling like, social pariahs oh so this is another scream murder yeah they were it is a scream murder murder and tori mm-hmm. tori's the one who was into scream so when the two of them the, kind of got together the whole columbine obsession and the scream obsession and then he's talking about strangling kittens and then they start to realize that we have similar dark interests yeah but the video clip is the video is insane it's freely available to see and if they hadn't committed the murder, then you would just think you wouldn't think anything too crazy of it. Because I've seen plenty of videos of kids saying crazy things that they don't actually do. Right. But the fact that they plan it this well and then actually do it is the craziest part to me. The planning of it as well was almost I mean, they'd scripted it because they have. I, I do have a question. So we know that they have murdered them, but. How did this, when they left the house, how did, what happened? So that's an excellent question. So they explained to the police, they had left a door unlocked at the house. So when they left, they could freely come back in and they came back in, um, you know, very late at night. I think it was around 1030 or 11 p.m., and they purposely left it unlocked and they had their murder kit ready to go. What was in this murder kit? It was the mask. It was their camera. It was the knife. And I believe the knife came from Tori's collection. Which he had shown them sometime after talking about strangling kittens. Mm-hmm. But they went there to watch the movie with Cassie and Matt as to set up the murder to for set later up the that murder, night, yeah. knowing she was going to be there alone. alone. To make sure that they had a way back in. But it's funny okay. because this case is not super twisty turny. It's a very linear investigation. You know, it didn't take a, an incredible amount of time. And yet it is covered again and again and again in the media. And they are probably one of the most, I don't know, researched and um, spoken about teen murderers in u.s history and there's a lot of reasons there's a lot of factors for Mm -hmm. that one of them i think the biggest one is probably the connection to scream you know yeah but um well and the wealth of archival you know with the with the videos yeah the videos um the connection to scream and two people plotting this kind of crime is two young people plotting it one is more understandable, but to actually get two people to agree that this is a good idea enough and that it needs to take place enough that you actually do it, it just, that's enough to just boggle your mind. Yeah. When we did the case, it hadn't really been as extensively covered as it has been now. Keep in mind, you know, there's been a passage of time, there's been a change in attitudes toward juvenile sentencing. And at the time that I was working on this, you know, we had to reach out to everyone, the victims, the police, the perpetrators. And, you know, um, Tori's family did respond and they wanted to ask some questions about the show and what we were doing. And what was really fascinating to me is they ultimately decided not to participate And they had chosen to be on a film called Lost for Life, which is executive produced by Scott Budnick, who runs ARC, the Anti-Recidivism Coalition. And he's also a big Hollywood producer. Um, He produced all the Hangover movies. And Lost for Life takes a look at um, juvenile sentencing, life without parole, um, various cases across the country, including Brian and Tori's. And Tori's family 
in particular, has taken a very staunch stance that Tory is innocent, that he should be released. And their attitude has been 